Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church. We welcome every one of you. We're glad to have visitors, and we appreciate them being here today. And you that's listening out in the radio listen audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in. The Northside Baptist Church Hour is coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping today we can be a real inspiration to you. And if you'd call a friend and have them to tune in and get this hour coming up, you'd be doing them a favor, I'm sure. So now at this time, I'll turn the service over to Tony. Now I'm sure what he has lined up for us will be a blessing to our hearts. So Brother Tony Crawford at this time. I want you to take your Bible and turn to 2 Kings chapter 6 for the reading of God's Word today. 2 Kings chapter 6. Someone was telling me the other day about these two uh, fellows going fishing. And uh, one said, I'm going to take my rifle along because if I see a snake, I'll shoot it. They got to the river and one got on one side of a big bush and one on the other side. The man on the upper side, his feet got kind of hot. He thought he'd slip his shoes off and stick them in the water. And he pulled his shoes off, stuck his feet in the water. The man below the bush had the rifle. He said to the man above the bush, said, you know, I see a turtle with the head sticking out of the water. He said, go ahead and shoot it. So he fired away and shot the man's big toe off. He said, shoot again. That thing's done bit my toe off. <laughs> now this tape today will be tape number 226. You're writing to get the tape. I'm speaking on the subject, the iron that did swim. Now we have 226 tapes listed. You're writing to get these tapes, say $3 each. I would be glad to send them to you and then the Income out of our tape uh, ministry, of course, goes to help take care of the radio broadcast and buy another tape and so forth. You can get the tape by number, by title, and if you request a list of these tapes, we'll send you a list, and you write in and get the tape of your choice, and I hope to hear from you. May God bless you. My mail has been off last couple of weeks, and I hope that you'll pray for me and write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. So you write to me, and I appreciate it so very much. Now, the entire message will be on tape. I'll be going off the air at the radio station probably at 12, but I may run over a minute or two after 12, or maybe even as much as five minutes. If I do, you and the radio listening audience can get the entire message by writing in and getting the tape. The message will be on the tape, although I may be cut off at the station at 12. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 6, and the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take this every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where well, fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cast down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand, and he took it up. Speaking on the subject, the iron that did swim. Now there's several things I want to notice about this scripture here this morning. Number one, these people had a desire to enlarge. This man, Elisha, was an old prophet of God, and he had a, a, a group of young prophets, and he was a teacher and instructor of these young prophets, and he had these students in his prophet school, and he kept growing until they needed to enlarge. And they had a desire to enlarge. That's verses 1 and 2. The Bible said, where there's no vision, the people perish. Everyone should have a desire to enlarge, or to do better, or to do more for God, than what they're doing. I contend if you'll use the talent and the ability that God has given you, God will see to it, you have more talent and more ability to use for Him. I contend if you walk in the light that God has given you, that God will give you more light in which you can walk. But if you're not willing to use what you have, God will not give you more. But every saved person has some kind of gift. The Bible, at the church right at Corinth, Paul said there, you all have a Today we have a, a lot of talkers, but very little doers. 
Today we have a lot of people that's willing to carry the piano stool when you need to move the piano. We have those today that's willing to do the little things and not help out in doing the great things. There are many of you sitting out here in this auditorium. You'd make a good choir member. Tony would teach you how to sing in the choir. And you can be a real blessing. I want you to pray about it. Oh, you say, preach, Evans, I can't sing. Well, Tony will teach you how to sing. And he'll help you and you'll be a good choir member. I would to God every chair was taken in the choir. And I hope someday every chair will be taken in the choir. And I want you to pray about it and think about it. You can be used of God and then be faithful in what you're doing for God. Don't just come maybe uh, one uh, Sunday morning and sit in the choir and miss the next Sunday morning and so forth and so on. Be faithful in your service for God. Whatever you can do for the Lord, you ought to do it. You may be surprised at the talent you have, the gift that God has given you to use to His glory. Many of you young people have a lot of talent out there. It can be developed, and you ought to let God develop that talent. But you've got to do what you can, and God will help you. And so they said, now we need to enlarge. And one said, be content, I pray, then go with thy servant. He answered, I will go. They did not ignore the old prophet of God. They said, we're going to build a new schoolhouse, a place where we can be taught, and we want the man of God to go as we build the building. And he said, I'll go with you. So every man had a job to do. In verse 2, he said, take this, every man a beam. Now the old prophet didn't say, I want one of you to get a beam, the other drag along behind and do nothing about it. He said, I want every one of you to get a beam. I want you to carry a beam. We want to build the place where the man of God can teach the prophets. Carry a beam. Don't go empty-handed. And I contend that every true born-again believer has a beam. You can carry it to the glory of God. Number two, we find that one man loses his axe head. In verse 5, but as one was cutting a beam, the axe fell into the water. Now remember, they were cutting down trees, timber, to build the schoolhouse, as it were, the place where the men of God could teach the young prophets. And they were cutting down the timber, and one man was cutting away, and all of a sudden... He lost the axe head off of the axe handle. Now this man lost something very precious. This man lost his power for service, for what he was doing. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 19, But Paul said, I'll come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. He said, I want you to know something. I want to know something about your power down there at Corinth. I'm not concerned about your speeches. I want to find out if you have some power. Paul was deeply concerned about the power in the church and among the individuals. A lot of church members have no real spiritual power. A lot of churches have no real spiritual power. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible said, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. And he tells where. Now God wants us to have power. Dwight L. Moody was a man that won over a million souls to God. Never much has finished the fifth grade in grade school, and yet he rocked America and England for God for this reason. He had the power of the Holy Spirit upon him. What we need today is not more degrees, and they're good in their place, but we need power to be used of God in the field in which we labor. So every individual needs power. This man lost his power. He lost his axe head while he was cutting down the tree, and this weapon was most needed. Now, this man could have been just a little careless about this matter. He should have checked maybe the axe head before he started cutting, but he did not. Maybe he was careless, and through his carelessness, he lost his power. And so he lost his cutting edge. And if you are not careful as a Christian, you can lose your cutting edge to the glory of God. They say the evangelist Charles D. Finney had the power of God's Spirit upon him, and every soul he ever witnessed to personally came to God if he didn't come when he witnessed to him. He came to God later because he couldn't rest after hearing Finney's testimony and Finney telling him about Jesus. Now why? Why was it so powerful? He had the power of God's Spirit upon him. Now you can lose your cutting edge as a Christian or as a musician or as a teacher or as just an individual church member. You can very easily lose that cutting power. And that cutting power comes through the power of God's Spirit and the studying of God's Word. Number three, he lost it while he was working. I want you to notice this. Here we find this young prophet cutting down some timber to build the schoolhouse, and while he's real busy, whacking away, he lost his power. Did you know you can get so busy doing things, running around like a chicken with his head cut off, 
doing religious work and lose your power while you're doing so. Now you can get so busy doing religious activities and fail to pray, fail to study God's word, fail to be consecrated to God, and you can lose that power. You can lose your axe head while you're doing that. Did you know there's a lot of God's people today just running around beating and banging on a tree with an axe handle with no head on it, getting nothing done for God? They lost that power with an axe head while cutting that tree and still whamming away at the tree with an axe handle. And you'd be surprised at the churches and people today that's doing likewise, trying to do religious work without an axe head on the axe handle, and they're banging around with an axe handle and getting nothing done for God. We need a good sharp axe on the end of the handle if we expect to accomplish anything for God. And so this man lost it while he was working. Verse 5. In 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 40, the Bible said, As thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. Here was the man assigned to guard our individuals, and while he was busy here and there, the man got away. Now, while we are busy here and there, if we are not careful, we can lose our axe head and finally have no power for God. We can lose while working. We can lose the power of the Holy Spirit. We can lose the very, very presence of God in our lives. We can lose the need of helping others as we sojourn. We can lose the sight of that lost sinner as we serve God. Some people get so busy serving God, they have no time to witness. Now, when you get too busy to witness, you have to look at too busy, period. Now, a lot of people get so busy doing religious activities, they have no time to sit down and tell that sinner that he needs to be saved and tell him how to be saved. So you can lose your power while you're working. I'm talking about church work. I'm talking about religious work. Some people stay busy all the time in different little programs in their church and never stop long enough to sit down and let God speak to your heart. Uh, get on your knees and let God empower you. I spend time in the Word of God searching out the Scripture. Your little religious activities will amount to nothing unless God is with you and you're getting something accomplished for God. It'll be wood, hay, and stubble when you come to the end of life's journey. He lost it while he was working. And I believe in good works. Every church in Asia Minor and Acts, I mean, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, there John mentioned, or Jesus did, their works. We're concerned about works. The Bible said, be always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. But at the same time, don't get so busy working till you fail to get low before God and meditate and do some praying and do some searching of your heart and searching out the Word of God. If you do, then you're banging away with an axe handle and you're working at a loss. When you come to the end of life's journey, it'll go up in wood, hay, and stubble. Number four, he was painfully conscious of his loss. This man realized that he had lost something. Now, if we can realize that we have lost something in our everyday lives, then we'll do something about it. Until you realize that, you're most certainly not going to do anything about it. Now, when you realize that, then you will do something about it. And he was painfully conscious of that in verse 5. And he cried and said, Alas, Master, what was borrowed? Now, he had sense enough to stop trying to cut after he lost his axe head. A lot of people don't have uh, uh, that much wisdom uh, to stop after they lose their axe head. They keep making a noise. Bang, bang, bang on the tree. And never knock any bark off the tree or knock any chips out of the tree. Now, we must remember if we've lost the axe head to do something about it. He immediately appealed to his master. In verse 5, he cried, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Here's a man, when he saw what had happened, he was standing there holding an axe handle. On the end of that axe handle was no axe. And he realized what had happened. He said, It'd be foolish to try to keep chopping away at this tree and no axe head on my handle. And he turned to the right person. He came to the man of God. And he said, Sir, I need help. I've lost the axe head off of my hat. He didn't go to some of the other fellows and say, no, wait a minute, you stop your chopping. I want to talk with you just a little bit about something. I, I want to tell you what I've done. I fooled around here and lost the axe head off of the end of my axe handle, and I want you to uh, pray with me about it. No, 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 no. He didn't do that. He went to the right person. He went to the man of God. He went to the prophet of God, and he said, I have lost something. Sir, he said, I have lost the axe off the end of my handle. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 13, the Bible said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? This is in the day of the with you period of the Holy Spirit of God. 
when Jesus said he is now with you. Now he'll be in you, and that happened on the day of Pentecost, but they needed the with you of the Holy Spirit in that day, just like we need the in you and the power of the Holy Spirit in this hour in which we live. And Jesus said, if we'll ask our Father, then he'll help us to find the axe head. If we'll ask our Father, he will help us to sharpen the axe head. He tells us so here in the Bible. But God is concerned about you cutting down the trees for him, getting the timber to build the house. He's concerned about that. He's concerned about every chip that you knock out of the tree. God keeps a record of it. But when you lose that axe head, you might as well throw the handle down, brother. You can get nothing done for God. If God's people could ever see that beating and banging away with an axe handle without an axe head and stop long enough to get their head back on the handle, then they do something for God. Number five, he lost that which is not his own in verse five. Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Everything you have is of God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 20 to verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. And he said, Go ye, I got the power. You go, if you can go, if you'll go, you'll have the low. If you go low, I'm with you. I'll give you the power to do the job. But you've got to be willing to go. You must be willing to do it. You must be willing to try. Oh, you say, Preacher Edwards, I just can't. I, I just don't have the ability. I just don't have the talent. How do you know? Jesus said, if you go low, I'm with you. If you don't go, you're not going to have the low. And he said, if you go, I'm with you. And then he said, I'll give you power to do that that you need to do. God's power is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. And he was concerned about that that he had borrowed. In Psalm chapter 37, verse 21, the weak had borrowed and pay us not again. Now I want you to let that sink deep down into your ears. The Bible said wicked people don't pay their debts. The Bible said wicked people borrow and they won't pay it back. Now a person that borrows something, uh, buys something on the credit and doesn't pay his bills and doesn't pay back what he borrowed, the Bible said he's a wicked person. The wicked uh, borroweth and payeth not again. Somebody said, well, I'm going to stop buying um, uh, my groceries on the, on the credit and, um, and then I'm just going to pay as I go. Now, before you do that, you need to pay where you've already been. Now, when you pay where you've already been, then you can pay as you go. I've known people that go and people will loan them or they buy things on the credit. People are kind enough to let them have it. And then they dodge those individuals. They won't pay their bills. They won't pay their just and honest debts. And the Bible said you're wicked. I don't care who you are. If you won't pay your debt, you just and honest debt. If you won't pay your bills, the word of God said you're a wicked person. How can you cut down a tree if you're weakened? How can you have a sharp axe head if you're weakened? Every Christian ought to be sure that he pays his just and honest debts. Oh, you say, now preach, I owe the bill. It was due at a certain time. I didn't have it, so I just didn't show up. Well, man, what you should have done is go to the man that you owe the bill to, explain to him that you're not able, if he's a businessman, he'll go along with you and bear with you because he wants to get his money back. He might not let you have any more after he gets it back, but he wants to get that back, and he has the acumen enough to know that he can get his money. If he got his money back, he must not make you angry. He must go along with you. He'll say, all right now, how you like to pay it? How would you like to pay it? And he'll smile at you. And then uh, when you get it all paid off, he might not smile at you the next time you go in. But at least you can go and say, Sir, I owe you this bill. I suppose I paid that today. Uh, last week, I didn't do it. I want to talk with you about it. If you are bear with me, I'll see to it that you get what I owe you. And anybody that uh, you owe would be tickled to go along with you because if they didn't, they figured they might not get it all. See what I mean? And so the Bible says, pay what you owe. In Romans chapter 13, verse 8, owe no man anything. That is, if you owe somebody something, then do something about it. Don't go around and say that, let them say that Christian beat me out of thus and thus. He failed to pay his bills. He was dishonest. I loaned him money and he wouldn't pay it back. And when any Christian fails to pay his just and honest debts, then the Bible said he's wicked. He brings reflection on true Christianity and on the church and on God's people and he should not. All right, let's move on because it's getting kind of quiet in this building right now. Let's move on to another step and that is number six. He had to do, he had to go to the place where he lost it in order to get it returned. Now here's a man here. He didn't uh, lose his axe head there in Jordan and say, I'm going across the mountain and see if I can find it. He didn't do that. 
He didn't say, well, now I've lost my axe head here in the river Jordan in this muddy water, but I'm going over here on the other side of Jericho and see what I can find over there. No, no, he didn't do that. This man went to the exact spot where he lost that axe head in order to find it. Now, beloved, the Bible says in verse 6, And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. Now, Jacob, when he lost contact with God, he had to go back to Bethel where he found where he got that power at Bethel. And he went away from it. But he had to go back to Bethel in order to be restored. The prodigal son had to come to himself, leave the hog pen, leave the faraway field, and go back to the father's house in order to get his feet on the father's table. Now, there's not a one of you, not a one of you, that's left God, broken fellowship with God, but what you couldn't put your finger on the exact reason and why and when you broke fellowship with God as a general rule. Mel Trotter was dealing with a man one time, and the man said, I, I have a, a terrible besetting sin, and, uh, and said, I, I don't know what it is. And Mel Trotter said, well, I'll tell you what, you just pray and begin to confess your sins one at a time and find out. Well, he hit the nail on the head, the very first one he confessed. That was it. Everybody knows where the axe head fell off the axe. Now, you can go right to the spot where it fell off, and that axe head is there, and that axe head can be brought out of that muddy Jordan, out of the mud, and put back on the handle. And so he knew where it was, and you got to deal with that very thing that caused the axe head to come off the handle. If you don't do something about that, it'll come off again. Now, I have a, a few tools out yonder in my house. If my youngest and grand youngest don't drag them off and, uh, and fail to bring them back in due time, I'm just kidding about that. But if you have young as you know what I mean. If you got a good old hoe and a good axe and a good saw, they might borrow it. And uh, sometime they wait a little day or two later to bring it back. Why? Because they're your children. Now they wouldn't treat a neighbor that way. I'm, I'm kidding with you now. All right, listen to me. Beloved, listen. I have some axes and a saw or two and, uh, and a screwdriver and a hammer. I don't know how to use them, but I have them. And uh, uh, my wife might know more about it than I do. But anyway, uh, I have these. And if that axe stays there uh, in my basement a uh, period of time, it's real dry, the axe will get loose on the handle. And uh, if I start chopping away, the axe will come off the handle. Now, I know that. Now, I put that axe back on the handle, and if I don't have the acumen enough to know that that thing hasn't been fixed, it hasn't been swollen, I didn't put a wedge in it, I didn't do something to keep it back on the handle, as soon as I go out again, to cut down the tree, that same axe head is coming off that handle again. And so in order to keep the axe head on the handle, you got to wedge it. You must put it in the water to soak it. You must do something. You must correct it. You must stop it. You must do something to keep it from coming off. If you don't, it'll come off again. Some fellow used to be an alcoholic. And he gets saved and then he, he's so weak and if he gets close to a liquor store, he's liable to slip in. And then uh, and when he does, his axe head comes off the handle. And if he don't keep himself on the other side of town or on another street and tie his horse away from the saloon, when he comes around that way the next time, that axe head is coming off that handle again. He must tie his horse across town to another hitching post. Now you've got to do something about keeping that axe head uh, on the handle. And it's up to you to do it. And it can be done. And so he had to deal with that very thing. But the good thing about it, he knew where it was. Number seven... We find a stick of branches cut, verse 6, he cut down a stick and cast it thither, and the iron did swim. Now the man of God just cut down a stick. He said, no, where did it fall? He said, right here, sir. All right, he cut down that stick, and he put that stick down in the water. And the Bible said he, when he put that stick down in the water, that axe head came up out of that mud, up through that muddy water, up to the top of that water, swimming. Axe head came swimming. It came up in Zechariah uh, chapter 6 and verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speak the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple. Christ is the branch. Now this stick here that he put down was a branch off a tree, and that's a type of Jesus. He let it down, and he pulls it up, and here comes swimming the axe head to the top of the water. Now Christ is a branch, and he was cut off, the Bible tells us, that we might be saved. The branch was cut off, he died on Calvary's cross, we might be saved. Number eight, the iron did swim in verse six. And the iron did swim. God can do the impossible. Now, it's very strange that that iron would come swimming up like a fish. Oh, you say, preacher, do you believe this? Sure, I believe that. I'd be foolish not to believe it's the word of God. You can call God a lie. 
that iron came swimming. The iron did swim just like, like a fish. Cut up the top of the water. See, God can do the impossible. Oh, you say, preach, I just can't do it. I can't do it. God can do the impossible. Give God a chance. Try it. See what you can do about it. And the iron did swim. God can do the impossible. God worked through America. God brought the axe head back. Verses 6 and 7. And the men of God said, Where fell it? He showed him the place. He cut down a stick, cast it into the iron, did swim. Therefore, said he, Take it up, take it up, take it out of thee. And he put out his hand and took it. He received that axe head back by faith. He was saved by faith, walked by faith. And there he received that axe head by faith. And verse 7, therefore said he, take it up to thee, and he put out his hand, and he took it up. Now he took that axe head by faith, it came up, he took it by faith, and it can be placed back on the handle, because he had borrowed it anyway, and everything you have is not yours. God gave it to you, it belongs to God. You know, we just have borrowed anyway. God gives it a gift, it's not yours. Everything that you have belongs to God. And God can lift your iron heart out of the muck and mire of this world by his power. Mid of an iron heart that stopped in the muddy Jordan, God can lift it out. Jesus went down in the depths for us. In Psalms chapter 69, verses 1 and 2, Save me, O God, for the waters are come unto my soul. I seek in deep my, where there is no standing. I am coming to deep waters, where the floods overflow me. I'm speaking to somebody today, you feel like you've been flooded out. You feel like you've been empowered, overpowered rather. You feel like the muddy water is about to drown you. You feel like, well, I just can't make any further. My God is able. I don't care how muddy the water, how deep it may be, what the problem may be. We have a God that can lift you out of that mud and take care of every situation. Many years ago, there was a man in England by the name of John Newton. John Newton was so mean. He was, his business was go and steal slaves and trade them. He's a, trade, a slave trading fist, weak and ungodly man. He could cuss in 40 different ways and never use the same word or phrase. He was so weak, he killed some of those slaves and threw them in the sea just because he didn't like their look. And he was as mean as a devil. He had a girlfriend in uh, England that loved him, uh, Mary Chaplin, and she loved him and prayed for him every day. She said, God, please save John. John was a big old wicked man, ungodly, a cusser, mean as a devil, going out and Robbing Africa and other places of slaves and bringing them in and saving them, making a profit. Robbing other ships on the sea. He was so wicked. One day a terrible storm came up and the boat he was on is just about ready to go under. That thing is about gone. Old John Newton got down on his knees. He said, oh God, if you'll save me, if you'll let me live, if you'll deliver me, I'll give you my heart right now, God. I'll promise you I'll live for you forever. O oh, mean, ungodly cousin John Newton gave his heart to God, and God saved him. He went back to England and told Mary what had happened, and she praised God. Later on, the same cousin, slave robbing, stealing, murderer, John Newton wrote some songs, and this is one of them that he wrote. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch might like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. He wrote on, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fear relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed." He wrote on, "'Through dangers, many dangers, toil and snares, I have already come. T'was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home.'" And then he said, "'When we have been there ten thousand years, Bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Thank God for John Newton and the hundreds of songs that he wrote. Let's stand our feet. Our Father, I delivered the message you laid on my heart. I pray that you'll use it. We feel that somebody here needs to be saved today. We feel that somebody in the radio listeners need to get saved. We feel that some have lost their axe head, and we pray that you'll speak to many hearts in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, as Debbie plays for us on the organ, listen to me closely. I'm going to let you go in a few minutes. If you're in this building and you're unsaved, you ought to walk down this aisle and get right with God. If you have lost your axe head or backslidden on God, you ought to come down and get it back. 
if you're looking for a church home like Northside, and you want to join this church, we receive you the way we receive members, would you come while she plays softly while we wait? Would you obey God? Come on right now. Come on. God will give you grace to step forward, and this preacher will help you when you get here. Come on and get saved. You have no promise of tomorrow. Death is so sure. Life is so uncertain. Would you come? I feel like somebody needs to respond. How about it today? You'll find no better time. Would you come? Somebody is almost persuaded. Won't you just break forth and come on? God will help you. God will give you grace. Would you do it? Waiting just another minute. Nobody responds, and it'll be between you and God.